on today's show, we speak live to Brian Robson, the England captain, who will be leading his nation to next summer's World Cup finals. But will Scotland be there? Defeat by the French has left Andy Roxburgh's men needing a point against Norway next month. Jack Charlton's Republic are a whisker away from their first ever finals. We've the best of the World Cup action for you. Also today, sport is booming in Sheffield. The Blades are being sharpened again for an assault on the First Division. Good afternoon. Good day. Now, Saint, what, what happened? There you are, favourites to qualify first, and England sneak in, and what was it like in not so gay Perry? Though? Well, it wasn't so gay Perry, Jim, but I have to say, we did say last week that we were saving it all up for the big night at Hampden Park, and that is the only way to go to Cup Finals on a wave of euphoria. Are you sure about that? Not quite, but... No, exactly. Yeah, you're talking <laughs> but yourself More of Scotland. In, in Later on. Right. But England have qualified. <clears throat> Let's just reiterate a few facts for you. Since the disappointment of the European Championships, they've played 12 matches without losing. The six qualifying ties were negotiated without a single goal being conceded. And all this was achieved in the face of a frenzied newspaper campaign against manager Bobby Robson, which sank to pathetic levels of personal abuse and vilification. All the manager did was pick the best players available, but it wasn't enough for some sections of the press. Well, there weren't too many apologies in evidence this week, but uh, skipper Brian Robson was quick to pay tribute to his manager on the trip home. He's talking now to Brian Moore at Old Trafford. Brian, I was interested in that public address uh, announcement on the aeroplane. That was clearly your support for Bobby Robson. Well, it wasn't just my support, Brian. It was uh, for the rest of the lads as well. Um, all the lads feel like that about Bobby Robson, you know that. He stuck a lot of unjustified stick in the press, and we just felt that he'd stuck by the players, and uh, we're just glad that we put him uh, into the World Cup Finals. You feel the mood of the players is absolutely right under Bobby Robson? Yes, it is. It's always been a good atmosphere within the squad and the lads work on that and we do get on well together. And so I think sometimes that goes uh, onto the field of play as well. The curious thing is, though, that you qualified now, as, as the Saint was saying, you've not uh, lost a goal and you've not lost a game and yet the praise is still very grudging. I think 90% of the press are very pleased that we're over in Italy, but uh, I still think there's a 10% that... Um, didn't particularly want the team to do well or I didn't want Bobby Robson to do well. Um, maybe it's because they've criticised him. But um, I, I've read a few articles since I've been back and there's a lot of people are saying that uh, the players think that they've more or less won the World Cup just because they're qualified. Now, as far as some people are concerned, maybe it's we, they think that we've got a divine right to be in the World Cup finals. But the players didn't uh, feel like that. We knew we had to work at it. We feel that we've done that. and so. We feel justified at the moment to have a bit of a smile on our face because we have qualified. The broadest smile must be on the face of a 40-year-old goalkeeper, I would think, as well. Well, there's not much you can say about Schultz. I mean, through the years, he's proved himself as one of the best goalkeepers in the world. He's kept that up for about 20 years. And um, he proved the other night that uh, he's going to take a lot of replacing. Now let's move on to Italy. I mean, what do you see the prospects there now in the World Cup final for England? Well, I think we've got quite a uh, settled basis in the squad. Um, we've got lads who've got a lot of experience in playing in World Cup finals. Um, and now we've got the nice thought of a few young lads coming through, pushing the experienced players for the places. And that's always got to be good, uh, you know, young lads coming through, challenging for places. I mean, we've got people now like Paul Parker and Gascoigne, Dave Rowcastle. They're all pushing for places. And uh, like we say, you know, that, that's good for the squad. Do you see uh, even a winning prospect for England in Italy? I definitely wouldn't write it uh, off. Um, obviously, we've got a fair bit of work to do. Uh, we know against Poland that they caused us quite a few problems, and it wasn't particularly the best performance that we've put up for England. But it was a good battling performance. We got the result that we needed to get us to Italy. And now it, it, it is a case of working on things and trying to improve. So when we do get to the World Cup Finals, that then we can um, put on a good performance, not for ourselves, but for the fans as well. Well, you've also got a good, uh, put on a good performance for Manchester United now. You're embarrassingly near the bottom of the table. The smoke in the boardroom seems to have cleared a little bit. You've a vital game near the bottom against Sheffield Wednesday today. Yeah, and knowing Ron Atkinson, um, this will be a tough one. He'll have uh, his lads wound up against us. Um, and it'll be like a cup final for them. But... Uh, 
Every game that you play for Manchester United it seems to be a lot fiercer of a pace than when I played for you know West Brom. Every game is like a cup final to the other team that we're playing. Um, so we know what to expect and what we've got to do, we've got to get to into a team pattern with all the new faces coming in, get into a settled system and once we do that I'm sure that the results will improve for United. Thanks for joining us live, uh, Brian. Let's go back to the Saint. Thank well, thank you. The two Brian's up there. Yes, at Old Trafford. thank you. Yes, uh, <laughs> Old Moore and his anorak and Brian <laughs> Robson. Thank you very much. Unfortunate nickname, Schultz, isn't it? Occasionally, it can yeah. roll off the tongue the wrong way, but never mind. Do you think Schult Schultz and I have seen in newspapers is saying that he wants to play in the build-up games, Jim? I think England have about six or seven fixtures before the World Cup. He said he would like to play. Do you think it's right that he should do that? Uh, I think it's right that Bobby Robson should be able to give most players that he wants to give a chance now. Too, because it's not a question of knowing what the team's going to be out in, in uh, Italy. I think Bobby Robson's made up his mind about that. Um, the problem is, is that between now and the World Cup, there could be injuries of a major source. We've seen it with Neil Webb. And I think that you've got to have players who have got to be tried in the remaining games where Bobby can at least say, well, yes, I've tried him and I'm prepared to go with him, that particular player. So I feel that uh, in the long run, really, he should give as many players a chance as possible. OK, fine. Well, <clears throat> on uh, Wednesday night, I was in Paris to see whether Scotland could use their second qualifying <laughs> opportunity against France. Now, just like in Yugoslavia a month ago, a point was all that we needed. But again, like in Yugoslavia, Jim, you know, we, we yeah. started the game rather well, in fact, for half yeah, an hour. Yeah, you kicked we, off, didn't you? Well, yeah. we, di we didn't look in much, ah. da much danger. And then the French got going a little bit and carved us up. And uh, yeah. the goalkeeper got a little bit of stick here for this near post. Difficult goal, shot to save there. I wouldn't blame him really no, on that one. Tall, no, That was a tough one. <laughs> but we, we had a couple of chances, this being the best of them here, when Ali McCoy volleyed against a bar from about yeah. seven yards out. Maybe he should have tucked that one away. No, that, that was Dimeco the got, got sent, sent off. Well, he, he'd been booked earlier and uh, a bit yeah. of a headbanger, you know, he was sliding yeah. in the back of everybody. But against ten men, we were all over the place. Look, defensively, Jim, you know, I don't know what happened to Nobody us. Marking but anybody Cantona there, was allowed was to run through, no problems. Yeah. Yes, uh, it's... You've got problems, Sam. I actually never saw this. I had left the stadium, Jim, two minutes to had go. Had you really? Yes, well, I You had. wanted a, a quick Campari and soda, <laughs> did you? <laughs> I see. St it, it, Stevie Nichol deflected, deflected yeah. the ball in the net. But, but, you know, as I say, I've, you know, I feel that in the early games in the World Cup, we were playing with a lot of were, fire, you know, and a, a lot of vigour, yeah. and we looked good. And but now the last was couple, gone, isn't it? No, the last couple of games, I think we've gone into a shell. Yeah. I mean, and defensively, I mean, the goals, we'll have a look at them again, Jim. Defensively, we're all over the place. Well, well, what, what, what do you attribute to it? I mean, here, here you had good defence. Well, uh, personally, on, I think this is a well-worked Well, well what, watch Gordon Strachan, top left yeah. of your screen. Now, little Gordon's back defending, yeah. fatal for the forwards. This. Look, he moves he, out. To play offside. To play offside, leaves a yeah. lad in there free. Yeah. Now, had he stayed marking, yeah. he'd have been in a I position to stop the I think it's one of the, the great ball. downfalls of our game in Britain that we play the offside rule against talent. Well, he, here again, we're, we're caught flat. Our two centre defenders are nowhere. Yeah. They're up the park. We're trying to play offside. You know, Morris Malpass plays a lad on and, yeah. and bang, you know, yeah. we're two down. Yeah. So, so there you are. So it's all down to the old Norseman coming to Hamburg and... and to having, Hamburg. You, you get Hamden. And you get what? A point? You need we a point. We get a point and, and that will be it, Jim. But I, I'm, I'm confident now that we will be joining England and the Republic. Are you sure? Yes, I'm very right. sure. Right, so Scotland still waiting, England through, and the Republic all but there. Well, here's the rest of the significant action with Martin Tyler and Peter Brackley in our World Cup Roundup. Staunton. Perhaps made a run in from right to left. Dunlop's come a long way, it's Whelan! Goal is given! Ronnie Whelan is the scorer. And that, in itself, is a piece of history. It's the first goal that the Republic of Ireland have ever scored against Northern Ireland. Whelan, that's beautifully executed the pass to Sheedy. Cascarino! A classic header! It always looked a likely route, and the route 
is to the World Cup Finals. Morris. Andy Townsend. Sheedy staunting away to the left, but Sheedy looked to Houghton. There's a shot on, there's a goal on, it's three. It's a rampaging performance now from the Republic of Ireland. When Julio Salinas gave Spain the lead against Hungary in Budapest, it seemed the Republic's place in the finals would be guaranteed. Defeat for Hungary would have left them too far adrift. Nothing to upset the form book as Spain took control with a second goal. Real Madrid's Michel guiding the ball in as Spain sought to tie up their own qualification. But if Jack Charlton was following the match on a radio somewhere, he'd soon have been thumping it in disbelief as Hungary fought back. First, Attila Pinta raising their hopes before half-time. And then late on, it was again Attila the Hungarian with the equaliser that means the Irish still need to avoid defeat in Malta to be absolutely certain of qualifying. Spain are now definitely through. Yugoslavia had already qualified and then took two more group points from Norway, the one team which can stop Scotland, even though the Yugoslavs had Bazdarovic sent off after only 13 minutes. Norwegian striker Jakobsen conceding a penalty for the second international in a row, a trip on Baljic. Hadzi Begic beat Tottenham's Eric Tortsvet right on half-time. In Group 1, the early goal from Aston Villa's Kent Nielsen set the tone for an exhilarating Danish performance that completely overwhelmed the previously unbeaten Romanians. This a match from which the Danes were desperate to collect both points to maintain their hopes of winning the group. Nowadays, opposing teams have not one loud up to contend with, but two. If this goal by 20-year-old Brian is anything to go by, you can understand why many observers believe that Laudrup the Younger may well surpass the achievements of his older brother, Michael. A brilliant strike by Brian Laudrup, Denmark's record export, now playing his club football with Bayer Erdingen in Germany. Only rarely did Romania threaten a recovery, and Denmark's surge to the top of the group was concluded by a third goal, courtesy of the PSV Eindhoven combination of Jan Heinzer and scorer Fleming Poulsen. But Sepp Jontek's team aren't definitely through yet. Romania can still overhaul them by winning the return. And in Group 7, Belgium still need one point to be absolutely sure of their place in Italy after a 2-2 draw in Switzerland. Knup sending Belgium a goal down after 51 minutes. All the goals in this 2-2 draw came in a 20-minute spell in the second half. Marc de Greiser equalised for Belgium. Switzerland's own hopes long gone, so with little to lose, they put Belgium under pressure again. Tour Kilmaz beating Prudhomme, and Belgium 2-1 down. Czechoslovakia and Portugal disputing second place in this group. Belgium needed an own goal by Alain Geiger to earn their draw here. Their last match, a certain two points at home to Luxembourg. So the qualifiers have swelled to eight. This week's additions are England, Spain, and one of the outsiders from the Central American group, Costa Rica. Mm. Bobby Robson, by the way, has already started his homework. Today he's watching Italy against Brazil and Bologna, a game you can see on ITV tonight, so check the TV Times for details. That was a pretty logo, wasn't it, that little we is that be, our World Cup? That is, we should be seeing that, Jim. 34 weeks to the World Cup, so we'll see oh. as we keep in touch with all the happenings in the we'll World Cup. We'll be bored stiff with it <laughs> soon. Then. Yeah. Now, listen, what about the goal that Belgium scored there? Oh, I thought that yeah. was outstanding oh, and, and worth another look at. It was a superb goal. It, it was a goal of sheer art artistry wasn't it so many players touched it in so short a space it just went backwards and forwards backwards and forwards lovely taken goal beautiful not, yeah. not a goal that Harry Bass would maybe admire would he? maybe not but we'll find there's the old Belgian lace knickers borrowed from the missus there <laughs> but there you are lovely we're pretty aren't they yeah. well that's that's it for part one after the break we'll be revealing the Barclays young eagle of the month we've a, a top game from Spain and we'll look at the continuing revival at Bramall Lane we'll see you shortly welcome back 
Now, if you're a sports fan in Sheffield at the moment, the future looks bright with so many good things happening. Now, that might seem an odd thing to say when you look at the bottom of the first division table and see Sheffield Wednesday firmly entrenched there. But at the top of the second, Sheffield United lead the charge. Just one of the positive aspects in the city right now. Martin Tyler reports. Sheffield is certainly a place to be for sports lovers. A major new development in the Don Valley will cite the 1991 World Student Games, the biggest international multi-sport extravaganza outside the Olympics. The Sheffield Eagles are in Rugby League's first division for the first time, and last Sunday shocked the new world champions witness. Though the clouds are gathering over Hillsborough, Sheffield Wednesday at least won their last match 8-0 to offer some hope of improvement. And at Bramall Lane, Sheffield United are celebrating their centenary year, promoted already from the third division, sitting proudly now on top of the second. Behind this revival, Dave Bassett, who's brought to South Yorkshire the same perky style of management which was so successful in South London with Wimbledon. United trying to recapture their first division past. A long raking through one for Woodward, first time! Oh, he's got a goal! He did a great one, Andy Tiz! Hockey. Oh, that's a good ball to Salmons. Salmons has Hammond with him. He's going outside him, across the goal, who's going to touch it for number seven? There is, I think that's the fourth for Woodward. It is indeed. Well, Wimbledon didn't have the tradition of a club like this, and obviously the, the club did have great players and stars, but they were in the past, and you can't live in the past. The past don't pay your wages, it doesn't bring the fans in. It's really what success we do. We bring in ourselves. We're building new heroes, Deans and Agana. We want the fans, perhaps in ten years' time, to be talking about those as well. The goals of Brian Dean and Tony Agana took Sheffield United to promotion, and their combination on the opening day of this season at West Bromwich Albion, Agana scoring from Dean's header, gave an early indication of the side's ability to do more than survive in the second division. And at Bramall Lane, they've even tailored the pitch to suit the requirements of Tony Agana. Well, in actual fact, uh, Tony Agana sort of regards himself as a bit of a greasy, but not as good in the air. And uh, he said, well, I only score goals, I'm not much good outside. Can we get the pitch shortened? So, you know, he's one of our stars, so we're obliged. And it is a little bit shorter, is it? Well, in actual fact, last year, I did ask the groundsman to shorten it because it was 117 by 75, which was too big. And he obviously didn't think I was going to be here too long, so he didn't bother to shorten it. Uh, <laughs> But this year we did alter it and we've reduced it to 113 by 73. And the reason I did this was because looking around a lot of the other teams, our pitch was a lot bigger and I felt that we ought to sort of have a pitch that was in average with most of the teams that we're likely to play. Sheffield United's latest success came at Molyneux last Saturday. Will Frostron on loan from Sheffield Wednesday, a neighbourly act by Ron Atkinson equalising against Wolves. Five minutes after half-time, the winner came from John Gannon. Gannon, one of three ex-Wimbledon players recruited by Bassett. The Wimbledon connection extends to physiotherapist Derek French and the coach, Jeff Taylor. Saturday, do you reckon Sins Gow's been injured? I think it's important with your staff that you work with people you know and trust and uh, you can rely on. And uh, that's why I brought uh, Jeff Taylor and Derek French with me. Uh, the fact that Simon Tracy and John Gannon followed me was they became available at Wimbledon within the price range we could afford. And Mark Morris came via Watford. Uh, Watford all of a sudden decided to release him and I knew Mark could do a good job. So it wasn't a conscious factor to go and get Wimbledon players because uh, it's easy to say we go and get them to play the Wimbledon way. When Simon Tracy and John Gannam were at Wimbledon, they were in the youth team, so they didn't really know what we was doing in the first team. So it's not Wimbledon Mark II or Sheffield United? Not really, it's easy to tie us with that, but it doesn't really worry me. You know, what's wrong with Wimbledon? You know, there's nothing wrong with Wimbledon. Uh, they've won the FA Cup and they're a credit to the first division. I mean, what's wrong with Jack Charlton and Era? Are they wrong? You know, I mean, they've got players playing there and Jack's regarded as a top manager, so if it's right for him to play there, they've not done bad in the European Championships, they've got to the World Cup Finals, so who's to say who's right and who's wrong? Football's a great game, we've all got our opinions. The only problem is nobody likes the long ball. <laughs> Harry, I like the long ball. Straight down the eye, diddle diddle, son, and have a chase and knock it in the back of the net. That's the game. That's the game. Actually, he did a terrific job. I mean, his priority is getting him back into the first division. Yeah. How he does it, I suppose, see, he's not really see interested. See, well, he had a right result getting the groundsman to... Shorten the pitch, the pitch as well. Yeah. And, a, and a good idea, wasn't it? Good idea. Smashing idea, idea for him. 
Right, next uh, week, Hibs and Dundee United go into action again as the only survivors of the British assault in Europe and we wish them both the best of luck. John Toshak is another Briton with high hopes as his Real Madrid team take on European champions AC Milan. Now last Saturday they came on stuck against Johan Cruyff's Barcelona. After a very shaky start to the season, defeat by Real Madrid might just have ended Cruyff's reign as Barcelona coach. The knives were out when Ronald Koeman was adjudged to have fouled Emilio Butragueño. Koeman, Barcelona's £5 million signing from PSV Eindhoven, caught struggling for pace. A perfect start for Real as Hugo Sanchez nonchalantly steered in the penalty. But Barcelona, to their credit, responded swiftly. A splendid turn by Julio Salinas. And with goalkeeper Boyo beaten at the near post, Barcelona were level. Controversy isn't too far away whenever these two teams meet. In the second half, it was Real's turn to protest after Martin Vasquez tangled with Eusebio. A penalty this time to Barcelona. It looked like a trip. All eyes now would be on Koeman. Like Sanchez, he's perfected the art of penalty taking. Barcelona ahead, and the result that may have kept Cruyff in his job was secured by yet another penalty. The persistence of Salinas, illegally ended by Argentine defender Oscar Ruggieri. Dismay for John Toshak, whose problems soon increased with the sending off of former Barcelona man Bernd Schuster. Koeman duly converted his fifth penalty in the league this season. Relief for Cruyff. In 90 minutes, his transition from villain to hero was now complete. A bad result. If I, were, if I was Tosh, I'd be furious at that number six for giving away that third penalty. How ridiculous. But he, he's an, an Argentine player and, and yeah. he's a big rough fella. I saw him playing yeah. uh, against Liverpool this year. Now he's playing there, Schuster's playing as a sweeper and defensively, mm. Jim, I don't think they're that good. And it may well be that the Milan will beat them again, I, though I don't think it'll be another 5 0. Oh, the 5 0 that I, I watched, as you know, last year was the most, most greatest game I've seen Milan play. It won't be that yeah. score, but it will be a decent score. Okay. Well, this morning, a uh, busy Bobby Robson has selected his Barclays Young Eagle of the Month for September, and he's chosen David White of Manchester City, one of the victorious under-21 team in Poland on Tuesday night. Now, Bobby describes him as being very fast and direct and an uncomplicated player, Jimmy. Yeah, he looks good. He even gets the ball out of play, back into play, so yeah, he's done well. But he good also cross, delivers yeah. good crosses. I mean, terrific ball out for the goal, wasn't yeah, it? It was indeed. And he's a big tall boy. Well, isn't he's he? six foot one, Jim. Yeah. Gets on the back post. There he's there, nodding one in at the back post. So, I mean, he's got all the attributes. You know, he's big, he's pacey, crosses a good ball and likes to score a goal. Well, so, we'll... a good selection. Yes. All right. Now, are we going to talk about the the? the two, two are we not going to talk time? about the, the Yugoslavian uh, goalkeeper? I don't no. know. I don't no. know. Are we the ref Yugoslavian referee or the goalkeeper or what? <laughs> all right. Well, we will. We will talk then about that, Jim. We'll talk about the uh, Yugoslavian referee. Let's, this uh, is something we've wanted to show, show you for some you. time, but we've always run out of time, so we're going to show you it this time. Yeah. It's uh, a match, Red Star Belgrade, and the referee is a, a Mr. Kravic. That's right. Now, it may well be, Jim, that's the answer to dissent in what, this country. Take yes. a look at him here. This Re was after the match had finished. This is referee Kravic. <laughs> Nicknamed Kerrygold Kravic, because he's the best butter in the business now. And... Uh, that was some... I don't know how he's got away with that, but there you are. Yeah, well, Jim, what are we going to talk about for the remaining time? Have anything, any messages for the fans today? Well, we've got 20 <laughs> seconds to chat, we've been told, and I don't know. I mean, the, the whole thing is it's been an excellent uh, week for England, obviously, and with Scotland still in the driving seat, I think we can all be quite comfortably happy that at this particular time. We will be in Italy in a few weeks' time, a few months' okay. time. OK. Right, well, that's it for this week. There's plenty of football on offer this weekend with local shows in the Granada, Anglia and Yorkshire regions. Also, goals of the day and that Italy-Brazil international later tonight. So join us next Saturday for some European highlights. We shall see you then. So, from Jim and I... We've still got plenty of time left, <laughs> but we know what to talk about.
was fishing for the big one, a victory over his old team. Bruce Grobler talks about the one that got away. And in boxing, there's a warning to the world. It's going to come in the world because Glenn McCarty can and will be Mike Tyson. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. But also, Good Jim, day. do not forget, it is the Skull Cup final tomorrow, the first big cup final I of the year. I have not forgotten. This is the program. This yes. is the biggest program ever, isn't it? So it says, yes. Uh, official program, two pound. Is that English or Scottish money, That's say? Jocko money. Jocko really money. Say. So it's four quid in England. Uh, we'll be talking about that a little later. Right, two fixtures this week gave a, a good illustration of life upstairs and downstairs in the Football League. Upstairs, the aristocrats of Tottenham and Arsenal met on a night when Spurs' new stand was open. It cost almost £6 million. Downstairs, in the scullery of the fourth division, the league's bottom two clubs, Torquay and Hartlepool, came face to face. The Torquay team was picked in the manager's porter cabin. But the great thing about football is that it can always provide entertainment, whatever the level. Both games lived up to expectations. We start at Tottenham with Brian Moore. Savoyes. It's in there! Oh, look, it's beaten there. There might have been a small defection on the way. But Finney Samways gets his first of the season. Spurs with a free kick with Paul Gascoigne. Touched on and another one! Well, Walsh got a touch on that one. And Spurs go two up. Richardson curving it in, a flick on. Might go anywhere, Michael Thomas! Arsenal are back in it! His seventh goal of the season. And that could be a really important one. 2 1 at finish, so success for Terry Venables on the field and for Tottenham off it. The attendance of 33,994 produced total receipts of £300,000, a record for a league match in England. Well, those kinds of figures are pie in the sky for the little clubs at the other end of the Football League. This week, the 91st club, Torquay United, were home to the 92nd, Hartlepool United. The attendance was 2,108, producing receipts of just £4,500. From the South West, Mark Tyler reports. Think of Torquay and you'll probably conjure up images of summer holidays and faulty towers. But this is Playmore, capacity just 5,000, the home of Torquay United and the venue for the bottom of the table showdown with Bobby Moncur's Hartlepool. Like so many lower division clubs, expenditure here often surpasses income. Every penny has to be spent wisely and facilities are predictably basic. New manager Dave Smith has to make do with a porter cabin office. So while the top clubs spend millions on new players, how much is in the Torquay kitty? I ain't going to tell you. No, not a lot, not a lot. I think Chairman are always, I think Lou Pope's keeping it, keeping a bit under the carpet for me, I think, you know. Might be 10,000 somewhere for a player. Yes, uh, you obviously got to watch the finances and, you know, where we are, you know, I suppose like Old Trafford and uh, White Hart Lane, they probably make more in pies than we do in getting money, but uh, that's, you know, that's the position we're in. There's no use making excuses for it. You've got to go on with the job. With kickoff less than an hour away, supporters begin arriving for the big game. The Hartlepool team coach has completed the final leg of the long journey from the northeast. Last season, 20,000 people from the West Country followed Torquay to the Sherpa Van Trophy final at Wembley. Only a fraction of them come every week. The new enclosure for away supporters cost £50,000. Tonight, it'll be used by just a handful of dedicated Hartlepool fans. But don't they get fed up? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, it is depressing, but it's a long way to come. We've made a little mini holiday of it. It's, it's like our fourth day here, and we're on the way home straight after the match. So we haven't had a holiday this year. This is our holiday, and with our first goal and first three points tonight away from home, we'll be happy as sandpipers. Yeah. Ronnie, it does not be, but I know you make a lot of noise, oh, don't we'll you? Oh, we'll make a noise. Yeah! Torquay took the lead after 11 minutes. Dean Edwards latched onto a pass from Paul Smith, and his cross was tucked home by Sean Joyce. Five minutes later, Hartlepool were level. Paul Dalton was given far too much room on the left, and when Don Hutchinson missed the ball completely, Allen was in the right place to smash an unstoppable shot past helpless Vasey. 
Another defensive lapse.